You big into strength, and I mean big into strength. If you are, go to Fraternity of Giants, fogapparel.com, use code HEAVYLIGHT, you'll save 10% on the best apparel in strength sports. Heavy Light! All right, with me is Jarvina Rout, Highland Games athlete, living on the West Coast, living large out there, better weather, better views than I have, but... I, I'm not going to hold that against her, um, but I'm happy to have you on the show. Throw Bro sponsored athlete, Darvina Rout. Welcome. How you doing? Thank you. Doing well, doing well. Good, good. So uh, we were just talking before we got onto the, the podcast here about like, uh, before we started recording about like topics and how we wanted to go about everything. And if you've listened to this podcast long enough, you know, like I don't really go in with a plan. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't go in with structured talking <laughs> points. I just like to hear people talk. And um Jarvina, you're one of the people that I really, really enjoy your presence in the sport. I enjoy your presence in social media. And I, I think it's a nice change of pace. Um, and that's kind of what I dig is people that are, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with like the, the way that a lot of people approach the sport that come from the world of strength sports, powerlifting, even track and field, stuff like that. And the, but there's kind of like a, a standard approach persona. And I just think you're one of the people that's doing cool stuff and that has a different approach. And uh, so, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just kick it off, like, kind of with the standard stuff. How did you get into this stupid-ass, wacky sport? How did this happen? All right. It was uh, it was very – well, I wouldn't say it was random. My husband's best friend, um, he's been going to festivals for years, and it, like, clicked with him one day. He was watching the athletes, and he called up my husband. And he's like, didn't your wife, like, throw in college? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> like, she needs to get out here. Like, she'll be really good. And his sons were – like, you know, the type where they didn't have a track and field background. They were more so just like looking stuff up on the computer. Like, it, you know, the guys that like practice in their kilts, like that's the group of guys. That got <laughs> yes, me I am well aware of that <laughs> type of person. Uh, shout out to Hayden Balio, who is an experienced thrower and about to be pro who threw in his kilt for TikTok the other day. So don't think we don't oh. see you out there. Come on, man. Oh, uh, yeah. So. It, it was, it was pretty funny, but the, I mean, I didn't, I, I kind of knew what it was. Um, I heard about it like here and there, but I never thought about trying it because I was doing track and field at the time. But I was like, if I get to this park and these dudes are like sword fighting or whatever, <laughs> just, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, babe, I'm out. But he was like, no, nah, like, you know, you've been talking about throwing and you know, like how much you love it. Like, it'll be cool for you to get back into it. So I gave it a shot and like my first practice, I like legit sprained my ankle, but I like hopped up, like, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a real athlete. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Like, I'm fine. like I just like tripped over my own feet, but Hey, it's been a while. And who the hell incorporated a, a second turn and a throw <laughs> <laughs> seems unnecessary. Like everything else is just one. <laughs> so I was like, uh, all right. So yeah, I, I, you know, practiced for a couple of months and then my first, uh, games was at a seaside and, nice. uh, it, it was cool. Like it, the people there, like putting it on, like, I'll never forget Beth, Beth Burton was the first person to like, come up to me and say, Hey, like keep going at it. Like you have a future in this sport. And I was like, Oh dang. Like, you know, that's what's up. I appreciate it. And everybody was like, just super awesome, you know? And uh, when we got like our lunch break, I went out looking for food, you know, rookie first mistake as, you know, there you go. Yeah. so I went out for food and like people were stopping me like strangers and they were complimenting me. And, and I was just like, what the hell is this? Like, you guys are actually like, paying attention I thought it was just like my mom and my husband <laughs> <laughs> well, that, like that's that's what it, that's what it was in like a lot of people's track and field in high school and college careers is like yeah like it's the people I know in the stands that's about it like and right. then Island gives it you don't yeah it's like the all of a sudden there's like I've said a lot of times like it's like a weird like hack it's like a weird glitch in the system like I have a crowd that's watching me what yeah that's it and I think uh, when I realized that from, I mean, day one, my first competition, I was like, all right, because 
for me, when I, you know, go to any games, it can be like college level or, or whatever. But if I looked up to the athletes as a young kid, I'd be like, oh my gosh, like they're so cool. Right. So I'm thinking like, if these kids are like into it, they're watching me, they probably think that I'm cool. So, you know, let me like engage with them. Let me like get them even more excited. You know what I mean? Like for them to be seen. And uh, I, I think that's, that's, like one of my favorite things like well besides throwing and doing my thing is like engaging the crowd in oh that's that's literally what it that's what saved me in this sport it's like I started off kind of in the same way it's like you know I, I didn't have a track and field background but I came to it you know like wanting to not prove something is the right word, but I wanted to accomplish something and I wanted to like get better. And I love the competition. And I started like getting really frustrated a few years in and like, it's, you know, cause I was throwing with just monsters in Texas. They were I was always killing me. I was always like, you know, dead last or close. And I just like realized like I had a couple of experiences where I would engage with the crowd or engage with kids and get them into it. And I realized that just like you're saying, the kids don't give a shit if I threw, if I was seventh place or whatever, they didn't care. Right. Like, they they, well. <laughs> yeah, they, they saw a big person in a kilt doing stuff that they can't even imagine doing a stone yeah. that they can't even imagine picking up or a weight they can. And then like, then you start to see, it's like, Oh, this isn't about me. Fuck that. Like, this is like, I am an entertainment product and I can still go do my thing and have fun. Like when I throw, but yeah, to your point, like there's, other stuff that like I can get out of this that I can like actually engage people and like get kids and grown-ups like watching <laughs> yeah like I've legit gone up to uh you know women who you know they're like oh girl you're killing it like when they say I can never do that or I can't see myself doing that I'm always like well why not you know what I'm yeah. saying? I was just you know thinking the same thing, but I tried it and I was like, come out, where are you from? And I get them connected and, and they're just like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, yeah, if you can pick it up and throw it over that toe board without falling over, you get a mark. <laughs> right. You're in the game. <laughs> in it. And then you can build up on that. You don't have to worry about like, you know, you can focus on your marks. And that's something that, that even I do to this day. Like if I'm throwing at Pleasanton, like I get the opportunity to throw with like the best of the best. And even though I'm going to be like, you know, down there in the markings or whatever, yeah. it's like, hey, but I've never thrown that, you know, like I get my PRs when I throw with, you know, the better people in it. And it's, it's exciting. Like, yeah, you last, but you did something better for yourself. Yeah. And that's, that's why we're doing, we're not doing it for money and fame, obviously. Like we're doing this so we can throw and we can continue to have a, a reason to go to the gym and get strong and try to like not you know, deteriorate and just keep chasing something because you get in that mindset, like early on in life, it's easy when you're in school, it's easy to chase like athletic goals and be in shape and all that kind of stuff. It, it's easier because life hasn't crowded you in so much yet, but like we've, we now we have this little stupid thing and like, it doesn't in, in a hundred years, nobody's gonna be talking about us probably not like <laughs> nobody's going to know, but like you have this thing that you can chase and you can keep doing that gives you you know, a, 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 an athletic goal as an adult, which is really, really hard to come by. I found if you outside of this sport, it's hard to find stuff that like, oh yeah, the, I, I want PRs I want to chase and a crowd that'll watch me. It doesn't happen anywhere else. Right. Like you go out for like a, a you know, co-ed softball team or something. Like, nobody's <laughs> cheering. Not by the <laughs> same thing. No one's going to be cheering. <laughs> right. Like, they're not tracking stats. Like, I don't know what my co ed softball batting average is. Like, I don't, I don't have a database for that. I don't know it. Now, you say, uh, I, and I really love what you said about, uh, you know, people in the crowd saying, oh, I could never do that. And, you know, really pushing back. Like, hey, you know, there's a lot of people that felt that way. But to be fair, you had a track and field background. So where did you, where, what did you throw primarily in college? What events did you come from? Discus and hammer. Discus and hammer. Okay. Which one of the two was your favorite? Um, it's weird. It started off with, with discus. Discus was like, I loved it. But then um, my second year I was at a JC and we like got a legit thrills coach and he just like encouraged me so much where he got me like, excited to throw and try new things and to push myself as a thrower because I wasn't always the biggest you know like strongest or he just said if you work on your technique if you focus on your drills like you know you can be up there too and he took me to um 
all the way to state. You know, even though I suck at Scottish hammer, because I can't. <laughs> <move my feet. laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I do. I, I miss. I miss Olympic hammer so much. I miss Warrior Hammer. And it's it's an interesting point because you talked about you know with with Hammer not being the biggest and the strongest like like off the top of my head I can think of people that fit the, but like Sean Donnelly is a great example like that he's not the biggest dude in the field like he's not he's strong as hell don't get me wrong but he's not the strongest like he's not out there but his technique is so clean and so beautiful that that guy's throwing the Olympic standard like you know like it's it can yeah. be done it's a, it's a very technical event and so i talked to Kyle Lilly um earlier in this season of the show too and he he was a hammer thrower as well and it it really continues to prove my theory that olympic hammer throwers wire hammer throwers transition the best of almost any track and field athlete to highland games so i'll ask you the same question i asked him why do you think that is why do you think you as a wire hammer felt like you had a, a natural step into all the weird events that we did um, I guess timing. I don't, I honestly don't even know how to answer that because I think for me, it would be like, wait for distance. And I can say, okay, well, discus kind of helped me out. Yeah. Yeah. But with like the hammer, I don't know, like actually 2020 in the beginning, the couple of competitions that I did get in, like I improved my hammers both of my hammers by 10 feet because I was like, all right, you need to start like actually grinding in hammers and not just like, eh, I'll be fine. You know, like, right. Especially when I was doing lightweights because it's like, all right, I can eat up a couple of points because I'm going to take all the other events. Yeah. But I knew going into 2020, like, oh, if I'm going to be competitive with the elite women and, and try to be up there and try to be like high in the ranks, like I need to step my game up. So I kind of like, you know, push my bread and butter to the side and like really focus in on timing and like feeling the hammer again, like the way I threw it in college and not just kind of like, you know, relying on, on speed and letting go and hoping that it goes the right way. <laughs> right. Just, just get to the finish as fast as you can. Just, just go. Like I was just doing like two turns. I didn't really like focus on, you know, uh, using my blades all the time, but I like dialed it in. I was like, fuck yeah, this is my year. And then it was like, oh dang, we in a penny. We in a penny. Oh yeah. Yeah, there's, and there's no gear. All right, great. Yeah, yeah. you know, um, so Colin, a fellow Californian, Colin Dunbar, um, he, I don't think he uses blades yet. I, I don't think he's stepped into using blades yet, and he's still throwing the Scottish hammers pretty decent. So it, it's strange. Like, it's it, two things that really pop out is like the like insistence on like finally giving in and doing blades is something that I really notice with uh, people that come from the wire hammer um that they don't want to do it at first that they take they take their time doing it but the second thing is like how it's so common with people that come from track and field that the hammers are the thing that usually lag behind at first you know mm-hmm. like caber is its own animal like i don't even count that it's not even a real event fuck that thing <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's so weird that, okay that's really uncommon that that's that's uncommon you you must enjoy the torture i guess i hate it i've always hated it. I'm, a terrible, I'm a terrible caber turner but yeah the, the the hammer doesn't come along what what's the pro, like what's the translation problem i'm gonna make you get technical like what's the translation problem from wire hammer to scottish what did you kind of discover in training for it what's the missing link what did you have to do what did you have what do you have to think your way through um i guess like high point so when i threw wire hammer i see i'm trying to be descriptive of my body it's a fucking podcast okay (laughs) (laughs) i was always coached to uh when i push with my right arm like to always like squish my boob with my bicep i'm a righty so right right bicep squished my right boob and then my high point would kind of not be all that high. But when it comes to the Scottish hammer, you really want to exaggerate that high point, which I was not comfortable doing. Like my body is like, bitch, what are you doing? No. (laughs) So um, after just taking it like slow, like my two PRs that I got this year, watching the video, it's like, like funny because it's slow as fuck, but it went. And I was like, you know, and so I was watching, I was like, you know, you hit hit position, hit position, hit position, go. Right. 
And so I was like, I'll build speed later on, but I just never got my later on. So we'll see you next season. <laughs> yeah, we're, we'll put pause on that. But yeah, just like any other event, like it, it only has to be fast right at the end. You know, like that's, that's such a, uh, that's an uh, inexperienced throwers kind of, they really get in love with speed and they start looking like a tornado in every event, you know, especially the distance events and not realizing like, Hey, all that other shit is just to get to that last moment where you pull it from behind you to in front of you really fast. Like it doesn't need to, it doesn't need to move fast the entire time. I mean, throwing the wire hammer looks cool as shit. I'm, you know, I always think about when I watch like really good wire hammer throwers, I love watching it. Like I follow a ton of them on Instagram and every fucking throw looks like a world record. Cause it's so fast. <laughs> like it, it's so fast and it flies so far. Like every, even if it's a terrible throw, I'm like, yes. <laughs> there's, there's nothing like, like I want to get back into it next year. Cause I can throw like, you know, uh, some masters, but there, there's just something about it. Like once you hit that first, like toe turn and it's like, go, go. It's like, you can, you can hear every coach that you ever had, like yelling at you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's, that's your internal motivation. For a good throw. Every coach I ever had is screaming at me <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> oh, um, okay, so coming from college to the games, how did you, you know, in terms of what you do in the weight room? I mean, obviously in college, probably some of that was taken care of for you. But yeah. how did you change, like, what happened in the weight room, how you trained outside of throwing? What, what was going on with you from that transition? I felt like I was pretty much still doing the same stuff, like um, always focused on like Olympic lifts, um, did some deadlifting. I basically just did like what my coach had me do, stay yeah. true to that um, until I got into strongman where that lifting took me to like a different level like getting stronger that's one of the reasons why I was like okay I can't be a lightweight anymore because <laughs> it was just it was getting you know harder to to stay that low in body weight and also like my lifts were you know heading into like a pause you know right. I shouldn't be getting excited about you know deadlifting 365 on a trap bar now it's like I can rep that out on the you know on a deadlift bar yeah and so, um oh. No, what is the, what's the lightweight women uh, limit for women, for those that don't know, just so I don't say it wrong. 150? Yep. Yeah, and that's, I, I was going to be one of my questions as to why you made that change, but I mean, clearly, like, if you're, you know, if the body weight and the strength, and the strength are coming along with it, I, you almost don't have a choice. It's like, what do you want to do, cut 20 pounds before a lightweight, a lightweight Highland Games? <laughs> no. Yeah, like, it's cool you know, while it lasted. But one of the things I always tell myself every year is train for the season you're in. So, you know, 2019, it was, it was a struggle after, you know, I made that transition, but it's like, Hey, I had to have that transition year. Then it's like 2020, we're going to be still, we go, you know, like you just make a plan for where you're at, where your body's at. And, you know, like I write down my goals, every off season and it's like, all right, let's work towards when we got work to do and then get it done. That is such a, it seems like a small thing, but that is such a consistent thing that I've seen with so many athletes that succeed is physically writing down goals. Like it's so, it's so strange. Like it seems like it's just like an afterthought. I don't know. There's something about it. Like, I don't know if it's like a, it's a chicken and egg thing. I don't know if like writing causes it to happen or if you being the kind of person is what makes you write it. I don't know what it is, but like there's just, there is really something about that, isn't there? About putting it physically on a page or writing it down somewhere. I've always felt For sure. that. Like affirmations or, uh, you know, calculating numbers only for like the big competitions. Like when I went to nationals, it was like, okay, I know this person can do this or whatever. Um, I can't focus on the maybe, you know, oh, if they do this, it's like, no, I know they can do this. So I need to do this. Yeah. So I write it down and that's what you work for. You don't, you know can't worry about what other people are doing well that's and that's honestly the only way to do this is like I, i'm okay with being competitive but i see people that focus so much on the field on the other people and like you know what they like just like you said like oh well he might get this or he's capable or, or she's capable of hitting this or she's short on this event sometimes or whatever like that's great but like we don't get to throw this stuff at the people 
Like, you know, like you're not competing directly at somebody, like you're just competing at the same time that they are like, you know, like, so you, you, all you can control is you. And like, I, I think that, I think it's good. Like having that idea of like documented is like, here's what it takes for me. Like, I guess that's the way I look at it too, is like, I'm not looking at like, man, if I get these numbers, I'll be at the top of the top of the rankings or whatever, like, or I'll be in top three. If I do that, I think about here's what I've done before. And if I hit these numbers, I know I'm firing all cylinders, like writing those, these minimum numbers down of like, or this range of numbers, like this is how I know that I'm in shape. If I hit this and like, this is the goal that it would take for me to feel like I succeeded. Like I did, I did the thing (laughs) that I was setting out to do. Um, So yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut you off there. No, I'm just saying being realistic about it too, because you know, um, if it's been a while or you know that you're weak in this event, like be real about it. Don't put down a 35 foot Braemar when you know your best has only been 29, you know, like right. <laughs> just, just be real about it. Yeah. No, and that's the, that's the right way to do it. And maybe that's what it does too, is that putting it physically in front of you makes you have to level with yourself too and realize what goes into that. Cause I know now, like, you know, I'm training for, master's world in November now. And like, yeah, I'm having to like put those numbers down and think about those sort of things. And I I've been doing it long enough and to where I can see like, okay, I'm at point a right now, here's the distance to the next point, like to get to that, you know, a 48 open stone or whatever. Like I know what it's going to take to get from here to there. I can't, I'm not just wishing it and saying it's going to happen. Like I have to meet all these conditions in between here and that number, like to make that happen. If not, that number doesn't happen, plain and simple. Like, you know, and then I, that's, I'll try to maximize to that m- number that I can, but you know, if I miss and hit 46, 47, it's still all right, I guess. Just kidding. I'll, I'll cry myself to sleep over it if I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I've seen that you've been throwing. So at, at least, you know, you, I have, I have. No, actually, those are all three-year-old videos. I just post them out once a month. <laughs> I just have like a library. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I've, I've actually shrunk down to like 140 pounds like I was in middle school. And I'm just, uh, I'm just enjoying life. <laughs> not doing this anymore. No, no, I have been, I've, I've been working. So have you, uh, have you, uh, you've, you haven't competed yet this year, right? No. No, but have you been, have you been training? Have you been on the, have you, are you on the bus? Uh, I have to think about that. It's actually 2021. Yeah. No, I have not competed this year. Yeah, uh, same. It's just different. Like I'm in SoCal, so like we have nothing going on. And um, honestly, the stuff that's been going on, like you know, outside of California, um, just hasn't really been in my radar. You yeah. know, like um to get things going financially my son is you know doing online school like it's just you know I'm not in a rush yeah same like I don't want to just show and throw I don't want to just go out and throw because it's happening like I want to be you know ready I don't want to disappoint myself or hurt myself (laughs) this has been a while mainly that like and I, I enjoy like getting out and just seeing the friends and everybody like I like that part as well too but I mean that part in a pandemic in the past, you know, year and a half, hopefully we're on the way out now we're starting to see daylight, but like that part didn't make any sense anyway, you know, like going and being in close contact with everybody didn't make sense anyway for me, you know, like I, and, you know, based on what, you know, my wife does for a living and everything, I'm more of a risk to everybody else than they are to me even, you know, like it's, so I, I don't, I'm, that wasn't even an option, but I'm kind of on the same page with you. It's like, I do like to just show up and hang out, but if I'm going to compete, I'd like to be, I don't know, halfway ready, right? Yeah. <laughs> at least somewhat in shape. If not, I'll just go hang out. You know, there's nothing wrong with just going to the field and like, Hey, yo, just I'll drink a beer while you throw. That's fine. Yeah. And everyone's like, Oh, you, you know, you, you've been lifting like you and you know, bless their heart. They're, they're people that aren't throwers. So they don't know, but I'm like, you know, um, thank you. But you know, drills <laughs> and the, the heavy ass lifting that I've been doing, um, it doesn't really get me ready as much as actual throwing does. 
you know. Uh, can, can you preach that more and more, please? That actual yes. throwing. <laughs> PSA TED Talk or whatever. Listen, you need <laughs> throws, drills with implements, actual throws. You know, break it down, one turns, uh, stop, drop, all that stuff. <laughs> Um, who is it, who do you throw with normally when you guys get together in South Cal, Southern uh, in SoCal? Like, who do you uh, who do you have a practice group, or is it just usually you by yourself? Um, I'm by myself most of the time. Yeah, like I, yeah, same. If I get a day uh, free, I'll go down to Vista and throw with my boo Felicia. Um, there's a Vista group uh, with Sean Smith, um, with Joe. It's like you know, a few people down there. Yeah. But most of the time, I'm by myself. So you, you and Felicia finished right next to each other in the rankings last year. I don't know if you guys realize that or not. Like, like she's literally like, I think she's like 10 points ahead of you in the database. <laughs> like uh-huh. you guys are like, right like this. It's, it's, it's pretty funny. When I, I just look at, I was looking up numbers before we got on. I was like, yeah, yeah, there they are. That's so perfect. <laughs> it just ended up ranked like right next to each other. I'm coming for you, Flea. No, <laughs> <laughs> so y'all were both throwing lightweight for a while, though, if I remember correctly, right? Flea is the one that actually kind of like motivated me because it was it was more than just like dropping weight or, um, you know, wanting to do it just to do it. Um, I was going through like heavy stuff in 2016. And yeah. that's when Felicia did her first lightweight at seaside um and i was just at that point just going through it but it wasn't until um i lost my sister-in-law um december 1st to suicide and it just like it sent me in a space that i've never been before where i was like you know i get what i've been experiencing is you know it's heavy everybody goes through shit but like she was going through some real heavy shit and I like nobody around her like knew, you know, so it just like, it stayed in me and it kind of like woke something up that was just gone for me being depressed. But I'm like, the way she was, she's like, you know, if you're not first, you're last. Like she was supposed to be at my competition that February. So she passed in December. She was supposed to be at Queen Mary in February. And uh, with that happening, I was like, you know, I don't have control of a lot of things in life, but I have control of my body. I have control of my goals. I have control of like the shit that I get and want to do. And this is something that I love to do. It's a blessing. And so I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna go after it and I'm gonna do it. I saw Flea did it and, you know, we're the same height, somewhat the same build almost. almost, (laughs) But I was like, you know, I want to try that out just to get me to focus on something, have a goal and like accomplish it. I had no idea that, you know, world records were going to happen. I had no idea that I was going to get invited to go to Scotland. Like just all this stuff came and it just kind of like confirmed, you know, all of what I experienced from December to getting to my first lightweight competition, which was in Vegas of 2017. I mean, I, 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 that's, pretty incredible honestly the the turnaround time to deal with grief and to be able to process and start to be goal oriented goal oriented that soon after to see that it took like i'm not gonna do a one-for-one comparison but in 2017 i had a similar situation and it took me a full year you know to really get myself back in order and really get myself organized again and realize that like hey i I love doing this silly thing and I love training for this. And I, I just think that's incredible that you're able to like really see that so clearly and able to make something like out of that to make, I mean, a career, like a new part of your life, a new thing, just like you set out to do. Uh, you, you took something, you took the talents, the body, the mind that you have, and you made something like now, you know, people want you on podcasts to talk about it. They want you on the board of directors to deal with stuff about it. Like, you know, they, it, it, it's impressive. You're a world record holder, by the way, talk about that. Talk about the world records. What are, t- tell us what your world records are. You get to brag. That's what podcasts they are about. Were. Is- they were, I don't think they're still standing, but I can say that I was once, you know, a multiple, uh, multi, uh, I don't even know how I say it multiple times I've broken like my records in the heavyweight and lightweight for distance and uh 
came so fucking close to sheep. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know how you get close to one? It's just like, fuck, that's going to linger. That shit lingers. But <laughs> well, uh, at least you're handling it well. Good. Right? Yeah. Oh, fucking sheep. Look, hands down, no question, the best kilt for Highland Games athletes is made by Sport Kilt. Go to sportkilt.com, use code HEAVYLIGHT, you can get savings on anything they offer there, which are the best kilts in the business. They also offer socks, which I'm a huge fan of. They have apparel, they have the multicam hat that I wear all the time. They even sold masks during the pandemic, and they did it at a really affordable price. That was one of the things I was most proud of, that this company just shifted gears and did what was needed for the community. They always do what's needed for the Highland Games. The great honor of working with Sport Kilt is that this is a company that whenever it's for something that benefits the sport of Highland Games or the culture of Scottish festivals, Celtic festivals, and the games, they always say yes. They always want to be involved. They put their money, their money where their mouth is. They put their effort where their mouth is. They show up for us. So the least we can do, show up for them buy the great stuff at Sport Kilt. And it's not even really, it's not just doing a favor, it's buying the best possible stuff. That's what you're gonna get from Sport Kilt. Again, go to sportkilt.com, use code HEAVYLIGHT, you're gonna save 10% on anything you buy there. Go grab the best, there's just no reason not to have a Sport Kilt if you're gonna compete. Um, no, it was cool, it was, I wasn't even like, like, yeah, hey, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna break all these records. It was just like, who like when I waited I was like I fucking did it I did you know like let's go have fun give me some food um and oh what's even okay so first record ever broken was in Vegas right so I uh it was first throw and I knew it was gonna happen because yeah you could just fill it in warm-ups yeah was like oh I think I took two warm-ups and I was like I'm done like I need to save it my husband's like you sure I was like I got it. Yep. So first throw, boom. All right. And Francis is, you know, hyping up the crowd like, that's the world record, blah, blah. And as I'm running and, you know, I celebrate big. That's one thing. If people know me, they know, like, when I hit a mark, like, I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to celebrate my accomplishments because I work fucking hard for it. And I Hell can't. Yeah. Hell you know, yeah. I just get excited. So I was cheering and, and going crazy. And then I hear Francis's voice just like change. And he like yelled, the tape. And I was like, what the hell just happened, right? Like I've never heard Francis mad. Well, uh, the people who were marking moved the tape before they brought up the metal tape. Ugh. So I was like, bro, what the fuck? So of course I just walked away. I was walking, I started tearing up, and I remember Flea running over, and she was like, you can do that shit again. I was like, this you can do more. Yeah, she was like, you just gonna do it again. And I was like, all right, you know, whatever. And so we're standing like a ways, a ways away under this tree, and all of a sudden we hear heads up. Somehow a thrower landed, like when she landed in the power position instead of facing, you know, towards the trig, it's her left foot was legit to the side of the trick like she threw straight into the crowd into the tree holy shit so you hear this weight is like in this and it's a big ass bushy tree so you hear the weight like pinging around <laughs> Hold on. what's it called what is it plinko uh, like plinko yeah, it was like fucking plinko right and it was like Dee -dee -dee -dee. and everybody and i'm like looking because and i'm in protective mode my husband's in protective mode of you know people around so um I just remember kind of like pushing my son out of the way. And then I remember my husband pushing me out of the way and then <laughs> it to the side of his head. Oh my God. And so he like gets up and he's like, I'm fine, but he's holding like, you know, his head and I see blood on his ear. Oh, so I'm man. thinking like, fuck, my husband has internal like injuries or something. Like he's bleeding from the ear. And so I'm freaking out and uh, we leave. What happened is, the the weight like skinned his ear and the handle hit him on top of the head but I didn't know at the time I'm just freaking out so um we leave because I told him he was like I'm fine I'm fine I was like no we're going you're gonna you know yeah get just hit, you just got hit with a chunk of steel man yeah like you got hit like let's make sure you're good and then I'll go back because he was like pissed that I even left with them and I was like no what are you fucking crazy like as soon as I'll see that the scans are good I'll have my mom take me back so the scans were good. We went back and uh, 
missed, I think I missed stones, but came back and I ended up winning by a point. Holy shit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and your husband was okay. He, yeah, he was totally fine. I mean, when it happened, he was like looking at me like I'm fine. But he's like, I, I mean, outside of my dad, who's a Marine, one of the toughest men that I've ever met, like in my life. So I didn't know if he was like legit fine, fine, or he was just saying he was fine, but also hurting, you know? So, um, yeah, that, that was my, my first world record and my first lightweight competition. That so was, did they, end, did they end up counting your record? Yeah. Oh, so that's another thing I'm missing out. This story, it sounds so fucking crazy. So while my husband is in one room, and I'm like walking by, oh, I still have on my, I wear a uh, jab, well, I wear high jump spikes when I'm throwing. Yeah. So I'm walking through the hospital and you just clack, hear me. Clack, 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 clack. <laughs> so then a, a curtain like opens and it's the AD's husband who was in there because he ruptured his calf. Oh my God. So he was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, what are you doing here? And he was like, my calf, like I. I tore it and I was like, oh, he's like, what's going on? So I told him and then I told him what happened with the record and he just got pissed. Like he was livid. He was like, fuck that. He got on the phone and he called his wife who was the AD and he was like, why can't you guys just compare the tape that was used to a metal tape and then give her the actual, you know, mark, right? That's fine. <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's, that's what ended up happening. When I got back to the field, she came over and she was like, hey, so talk to so many people that you know signed off because it's not actual like real rule that has to be the metal tape that comes out after like we can just compare it so here's the mark you got it congrats and I'm like don't really feel like I can enjoy it now <laughs> <laughs> the mood has been dampened slightly <laughs> I was like oh, I'm done like fuck let me just finish the last two events and uh give me some scotch there you go. But you got the win, though. That's uh, that's such icing on that story that, that you actually managed to win by what? One or two points, you said? One point. Oh, man, that's the best. <laughs> Who was second place? Do you remember? Because I'm going to get them on the podcast next. <laughs> uh, I think it was Lauren Fallon. Okay. Uh, I'd like to hear her version of that story. It's like she left and then came back and beat me. <laughs> I was like, bitch. Nah, she's actually my homegirl, though, so I don't think she was like. <laughs> she's not going to be too mad about it. Good, good. I like that. So um, so you said heavyweight records, right? And is that the, what other, did you have a records in lightweight at any point? So it was the heavyweight and the lightweight. Heavyweight um, and the lightweight, okay. The lightweight first didn't quite, because the heavyweight was like weird to me, like timing wise. People yeah. always say, oh, it's going to be easier, but it's like, I mean, if, if you know, like all the technical, like, you know, work that goes into weight for distance and the timing, you're used to the 28, right? Which is okay. And then the 14 is like nothing, but the 21 was just, it was weird. So I'm yeah. like, I legit had to give myself, uh, like a lengthy time off of dealing with the 28 and just focus on the 21. Cause I would, I would like go back and forth I do like the women's open class and the women's lightweight so I was throwing both but I'm like the 21 isn't going anywhere and I know I can get this damn record like I should be chucking this shit over 50 feet already yeah I finally did it I can't even remember it was like forever ago it was like 29 it was like you had 50 plus marks and I think 2018 2019 I think both years I think you did yeah it was yeah 2019 was like my last um ever like lightweight competition and so I spent I spent most of my career throwing the 56, and then when I changed over to lightweights, they throw the 42 for the weight for the same kind of thing you're talking about. Like it's it's an adjustment because it's way different than throwing the heavier one. The heavier one is just like you got time to like plan your day and shit through the middle of that throw and like think about how much it hurts and all that. But like the 42 is a little faster. Like there's a common thing that gets said is like it throws more like the lightweight. Like you can move it a little bit more like the lightweight. It's sort of true. It's sort of not. Did you feel that way with the 21 that you could move a little bit more like you did with the 14? Yeah. But when I did that, like when I would start moving too fast for it, then that's when I would start messing up. And, and the 14 so light, so light. Yeah. 
So, and I still get that way with the 14 where it's like, all right, be patient. If I don't feel it like at my hip or if I start moving too fast and then it gets like behind me, I'm like, oh, this is, that's it. This is shit. <laughs> right. I know already. <laughs> I don't need to see the rest of the throw that's going to happen after this. <laughs> More than aware. So I, I, I want to ask this question because I haven't had a lot of in-depth conversations with women that are kind of at the top of the games in this. You know, obviously, just by as a matter of course, the women's implements were kind of developed later on and kind of based on the, the men's implements. Do you think they've got it wrong anywhere? Do you think the weight of the women's implements needs to be adjusted or changed up or down anywhere? Because I've heard all sorts of arguments that are all over the place, but I've never heard a consistent one. What do you think somebody that's thrown both light and, you know, the, the heavier versions, like, what do you think? Like, do they have it right? I feel, well, as far as it being like challenging or like too, too challenging or challenging enough. Like, is, are there, are there, are there implements that are too light? Are there implements that are too heavy? Like what did, have they gotten it right? Because they really did just kind of base it off of the men's stuff. And that makes me wonder, like, if you're using that as like, Oh, just cut it in half. Like, is that, is that right? You know, like, do you, do you feel like there's any ch- room for change anywhere? No, I mean, it feels right as far as, um, especially like the 28, like, that's a good number. I, I know that there was like a debate going on, uh, which has nothing to do with me for another six years, but with the masters throwing yeah. the 28 as opposed to 21, but I feel like, if everybody in your class is throwing that way, isn't it kind of like the same shit? <laughs> well, and that, that's kind of, that really is, that's kind of like the old school way of looking at it that I've, I've I think I've developed more and more over time is like, look, if everybody's throwing the same shit, who cares? <laughs> like, you know, cause it's all like anything's too like easy. Like, yeah, the 14 is, yeah, it's, it's light and it's slippy, but I guess is that the way the 28 feels for, you know, the pro men. Yeah, probably. Um, I don't know. I've never, I've never thrown as far as they do, so I couldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I guess like, I mean, when you look at the numbers, uh, what is it for the lightweight? I mean, I think probably, yeah, the fourteen probably seems pretty light. Actually, weirdly enough, I have the women's rings up looking at them, but like. There's probably more women throwing the lightweight farther than there are men throwing the lightweight that far, but it's not like out of control. You know, it's not crazy. I mean, Jamisa threw it a hundred, which has never been done for men. It's been close, but I think yeah. you have a lot, you have a lot more women at the top of the table that are like above 70, you know, than you do, than you do for the men a lot of times, proportionally speaking. So, but see, here's my thought on it though, is I like the light implements because they fucking go far. And like, not just for me as a thrower, like, I think that's cool for the crowd. I think it's a lot cooler to watch lightweight than it is to watch heavyweight. Like you can appreciate that heavyweight is hard, like that it's heavy and then everything like that. But as the crowd, like light hammer and lightweight are fucking where it's at. Man. Those are cool. <laughs> right. Well, the crowd gets excited for the stupid high defense, but you know, it's cool. Oh, they do because it's easy. It's, it's like, oh, how have I said this before? Uh, they're either like, uh, yeah, or, oh, that's all. <laughs> that's the only two options. You know what? Because they, they know exactly what's going on. They can see, oh, she got it over the bar. Oh, she didn't get it over the bar. But when we're throwing like, oh, that kind of went far. All right. Yay. Go. You Yay. Know. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. yeah I'm, I'm sorry. A lot of people don't know the difference between a 60 and an 80 foot throw. They just don't. <laughs> Unless they're standing out there watching it. They just don't know. And it. It is, it, as long as it looks cool and you scream loud, there's like a good percentage of the crowd that's really going to like what you do. No matter what. As long as you don't fall. See, they're never going to know because I'm not much of a yeller when I throw. Really? You're a, you're a silent yell. You're a silent thrower. Not silent, but it's like, you know, if it escapes, then that's <laughs> because Yeah, or, or like a whatever. I'm not going to do it, but... <laughs> I, I can't force myself on the mic yeah i can't right. i can't like mimic it but yeah i'm not like a, i guess that was also my coach's doing because he used to talk so much shit and it would it would be like the funniest um at me it's when these dudes would be like ah, you know and it's like bro that was like 110 you know like a discus and right. like, 
<laughs> he's like, oh, they yell. It only went 110 feet. Like he's talked so much shit, but he was, he's also like a six foot seven older black man. So who's going to tell him anything? You know, like. <laughs> right. Looks like an offensive lineman. So nobody's yeah, exactly. going to say shit. I was, like, you know, I was like, okay. You know, well, I can appreciate that. I think the only time I, I've got one of the, I feel like I have one of the worst yells in the game. So I probably should pipe it down a little bit, but like mine really comes out on hammer because I, I feel like I'm like so tight for so long. And then I finally get to let go of the goddamn thing. And then, like, ah! <laughs> <You can just, laughs> wait, one more time. <laughs> no, no, you will not get that again. I'll, I'll sample that out to be the new show intro though. Just me doing that. <laughs> I'll just make it on the beat. Just you know. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> no, it's um uh, like I, I I've said I train with uh um, I train with everybody's good friend Spencer Tyler for a long time and he has the highest pitched scream of a man that size that I've ever seen in my life and I think training with him for so long just got it into me that like oh yeah just let just let it happen you think you sound like a party favor but it won't matter it just helps to throw farther. All right. So what do you have, what do you have coming up this year now that you're trying to get back on the back on track? Like, what do you, what are your plans? Like where, where do you want to compete next? What do you like? And then what's the, what's the end goal for 2021? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, I'm probably going to like get one games in. Um, Cause I like, I also dabbled like last year I was like, this is a freebie year. I'm just going to try stuff I never did. And uh, I did like a push pull and powerlifting and, uh, did a strong man competition where I coached myself and that was like a big deal because it's like going into you know a competition alone and did well with the heavyweights but um I just want to do a competition I've never done before and that's Prescott it always like falls in um I think like right after Pleasanton and I usually like to get one game a month in if I can yeah yeah i think that's third week of september i'm not sure okay so that's i mean that's that's a good ways off probably be in shape by then <laughs> yeah well i didn't want to like, miss, like anything because uh my husband surprised me with a trip to cabo which is Ooh, cabo. look at you look at you right? yeah so i was like i just want to go do nothing and get shammered <laughs> 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 yes that is the correct thing to do it's like it's been a really fucking hard year and a half almost a half but yeah so yeah um when this whole thing started um yeah a lot of people like there was like two there was like two different responses to like when it all kicked off last year it was like the people that were just like well, it's, we got to make it happen. We got to keep these games. We got to make them happen. And then like, there was like a lot of people are just like, hey, you know what? It's not the highest priority thing for me right now. Like it's, and like, maybe we need to focus on some other stuff. And like, we had a pandemic, we had race riots, we had the fabric of the country falling apart. It's like, you know, it was really hard for, I think a lot of us to be like, yeah, let's let, let definitely, I want to focus on throwing right now. It just, it wasn't the year for it. And I don't think like, I don't know. It, kudos to somebody that did continue to work and work and work. I just don't know a lot of people personally that made it their top priority. I don't. Same. I feel like, like I said, um, my son, he went through his whole first year of high school, you know, on the computer, like yeah, loving it. You know, he's an honor roll kid, but his grades didn't show it because he was like, you know, I mean, he didn't say it, but his attitude was like, man, fuck this, you know, and I understood it. <laughs> yeah. And there are no books about, you know, parenting through a pandemic, like what, you know, so yeah, my priorities were completely shifted. I was still like lifting, but that was more so, you know, just to still have something for myself. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, I, sanity. That's that, those for sanity. Right. Yeah. Like you yeah. as a dad, you got you know, a couple on me, but yeah, like I got, I think like six, 65 kids. Um, but yeah, like that's what the, like a lot of the outdoor stuff became for me. That's what hunting became for me. It was just like, this is sanity. Like it, lifting wasn't even meant for me. Like it was just like, I got to get out of the house. <laughs> like, I, like I, I've got these people here constantly. And it's same as you, like my son, my oldest, like it was his first year of middle school, man. Like that, that sucks. 
that's a really formative time. That's a big year. Like, a, you know, he's back now, but like the first half of that first year, he was just home. And that, that's hard, man. There's so much, there's so much beautiful awkwardness in middle school and high school that I don't want them to miss out on, you know? No, I was like, it's your freshman year. You're supposed, you know. And then I told him, I was like, you're already lucky that you got your braces off before your first year of high school. Like you were supposed to carry that awkwardness into high school. Cause yeah, yeah. I'm not just being like that mom, but I have a good looking kid. Like he's just a handsome kid. So I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, you know, you're going to go and you'll probably get asked to dances and stuff. And like, I was just excited for him to start like being more social. And then, <laughs> you know, this happened. So um, yeah. yeah, I, I, wasn't focused on throwing too much it was more like staying sane keeping my kid happy making sure my husband's good you know uh because his mother is going to be 90 this year so you know staying safe around her because if she got that I, you know that would have been awful so we yeah. were just much like in the house my garage is my gym and that's what we've been doing for a year and a half well, it'll, it'll be really, really nice, though, I mean, to finally to see you, to see Felicia, to see everybody out doing their thing on the field again, because I think what I think what you, um, Felicia and a lot of other people, the people that I really try to focus on with this podcast, I think y'all are doing such cool things for not just the training aspect of the sport, but like the image of the sport and like where we're headed and that, you know, we're I think a lot of the Scottish Highland games is definitely like a typecast kind of thing. And there's like a certain kind of dude or a certain kind of woman now that you expect to be in it. And we're just getting you and all these different kinds of personalities now. And like people that are like outspoken, that are silly, that are, you know, not afraid to make fools of themselves and not afraid to state their opinion on anything. Like I, I, I dig that stuff. So I'm looking forward to you getting back out on the field because I think, I, I mean, I think you make the sport better. I really do. And I think, you know, regardless of, you know, whether somebody has a good year or a bad year, like those are the people that I'm into in this sport is like, you know, I don't know if you kind of feel that same way, but like the people that I get into watching in this sport are not always like the best, like the, the number one throwers, like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to watch Jordan, you know, like, like it's, you know, I like, a, you know, I like all the Dennis Rodman's like, you know, I like them all. Like I like all, you know, I, I like the people that bring <laughs> Just kid right over uh, Scotty like that. Okay, that's cool. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's not fair. That's not fair to skin. Yeah, that's not Scott. right. <laughs> uh, I was I was I was happy when he went to Houston. I thought it was great to give him a chance to shine. Um, I was really I was proud of Scotty in that time. But uh, yeah, like that. Though, that's the kind of stuff I dig. Like I guess because I've been doing it long enough, like about a decade, and like you know I've been around really really great people, like really great throwers. And I, I think just the number one thing about this is like the, like the oddballs, the weirdos and the personalities. And those are the people that I think are the most interesting. That's who I like to throw with. I just like to meet people who are not dicks, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, like, yeah. It, it, I gotta tell you, like the, the biggest like refreshing moment and like throwing was meeting Adrian. Um, because, you know, when I started practicing with that group of guys, I didn't really know what they were doing. Um, yeah. So I had the track and field background. I was like, let me go watch, you know, some like videos and then I try to like mimic it. And of course, uh, you know, I saw like different guys or whatever, but then I saw Adrian and like her build and stuff. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna watch, you know, how she throws because, you know, speed will probably be there and, and she looks very technical. And so I like watched a bunch of her stuff and then I met her and she was just like, cool as fuck. Like, yes. you know, and so I was like, I want to continue to like pay it forward and be that example that Adrian set for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care if, you know, if you're a sea thrower novice or whatever, like we all out here doing the same shit, you know, yeah. like just at different levels, but the people who are just genuine and just not dicks or, are my people. <laughs> yeah, and Adrian is one of the sweetest human beings I've ever met in my life. Like she is one of the sweetest people and she's like she's goofy, she's funny and she's brilliant about throwing all at the same time. Like she's all that stuff. And like she's just one of those people like I wish 
just like you said, I wish she's such a great technical model for uh, for women to throw because she doesn't just dominate with like size and power. She's plenty powerful and strong, but like she's so technical and she's technical in the Highland game. She's not just like track and field technical that worked over this. She's put in the hours in this sport. She realizes that this is not track and field. Like this is its own thing and she trains that way. And I just wish that we had hundreds of hours more video of her than there is. You know, like there's, there's hundreds of hours of me but that doesn't help anybody. <laughs> that doesn't, like, that just, like we need a, we need Adrian, not me. <laughs> you need more of that. But yeah. Like her, her, the, her technical approach to throwing, like that's, that's what I'm excited about too. And that like, we have a generation of throwers now that are more in touch with take turning on a video, turning on their phone and actually getting video of what they're doing. Because, you know, think about what that meant for even you and I, like we're, we're not the, we're not the youngest throwers in the game, but to have access to people on YouTube, on Instagram, anywhere else to watch them. Like that was like finding gold is to find somebody that actually posted their shit. And now we have like dozens of people like yourself that actually put out, like they'll put themselves training and throwing. It's like, Oh yeah, it's supposed to look like that. That's one of the reasons why I started my page. Like, honestly, it, yeah, it was like more of, you know, my training log and, you know, posting my throws, but also so people can see, because like you said, we didn't really have that. Like I went, I searched for it and it was like on YouTube, <laughs> so the, yeah. but uh, just having stuff like actually broken down, like step by step, I didn't have that. It was like each competition, uh, like Beth would coach me and I'll be throwing against her and Beth would yeah me out you know just like you know do this like she taught me at Costa Mesa like how to uh you know spin to win and you know walk because she was like I think you you can get this down like because you know your um your technique is there and I was like are you sure like is this gonna go flying somewhere (laughs) and (laughs) but it worked out you know and I think I ended up beating her and I was like you just coach me when you didn't have to and I just you know like it was just yeah And that's, I mean, I guarantee you for Beth, that was a highlight of her day more than her winning. Like, and that's, uh, that's the right attitude is like, there's like I've said before, there's no million dollar contracts. There's no TV deals, anything like that. Like what you get out of this being a person, like is really all that, all you actually get to take away from it. That's it. Like, okay, you get some swords and shit once in a while. (laughs) You get like swords and plaques and some cool. Have you gotten a sword yet? Have you gotten a sword? Huh? Have you gotten a sword yet? I have several swords because when my son was younger, like he thought it was cool, you know? And so like, uh, yeah, like when I went back to Vegas, that was like, I got a big ass sword and he was like, oh my gosh, you know, like he was what, 10, 11 at the time. Now he's going to be 15 in a few days. So it's not as cool. So yeah, yeah. I'm still, I'm still enjoying that time. My, my son is 12, my daughter's eight, my youngest is four, my youngest girl is four. And they, they still think it's cool. Like, you know, the, the stuff I bring home or like that I do it and stuff, but I'm just waiting for the first time. It's like the eye roll happens when it gets talked oh. about that. That's when it's time to retire. I think oh, oh, it's coming. It <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but it is, it's a switch. Like uh, I'm telling man, my son used to think that I was cool and, and, and stuff. And now it's just like, hmm. All you get is like grass for answers. Oh God, I can't wait. Well, I'm only a couple of years away. And I mean, I'm, I've had practice. My, my wife already eye rolls at Highland Games plenty. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not too unfamiliar with it. Speaking of giant swords, I always have to say this. You know, I didn't get my first giant sword or you know, like really any kind of sword until like my eighth year in the sport. What? Yeah. Like all, like anytime I would win or anything, I'd always get like, uh, like a plaque or like a fucking steel coyote statue or something. I have up here like, like I'm looking at the shelf right now, like a, or a cup or like sometimes money, which is great. Don't get me wrong. Like I like money. That's cool. But like, I just wanted the stupid big sword. I didn't get it to my eighth year throwing. I got it. No, now I'm just going to mount it on this wall right here. And then- <laughs> <laughs> just- Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just every time I come on the podcast, every time I have you on the podcast, there's a new sword. I'm just gonna add all my swords and daggers. Like, there's my wall. <laughs> the motherfucker. 
<laughs> All right, Jarvina, it has been really, really awesome talking to you. I'm glad we got the chance to do this. Where can the people find you? Where do they find you on social media and all the other kind of stuff? Uh, I'm on Instagram at jroute thrower, J A Y R O U T T thrower. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. I'm gonna do Facebook because everybody's racist uncles on there, so <laughs> I just be on Instagram minding my business. Uh, I post uh, really funny ass stories and I uh, post my workouts and I break down some uh, throwing technique for you. Nice. Well, there are far less racist uncles on Instagram. Not zero. They're not, not zero. <laughs> but I'm not following them. They're not following me. They can stay over there. And we just keep, keep that wall up right between. That's just fine. Yeah. You guys. T- <laughs> and if you, you guys- are following me. <laughs> nice. All right. All right, Jarvina. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Heavy Light is brought to you by Throw Bros. Throw Bros is the only online store for Highland Games athletes. Gear up, get throwing. Use code HEAVYLIGHT, all one word. You're going to save 10% at throwbros.com. Thank you.